Hello. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome. Thank you for, for coming to the 38th annual Schumacher Lecture. Uh, my name is Matt Stinchcomb. I'm the board chair here at the Schumacher Center for New Economics, and really grateful that you all came here today. It's going to be a really excellent program. Uh, I just want to thank a few people, um, but first I want to share the mission of the Schumacher Center, which is to envision a just and sustainable global economy, apply the concepts locally, especially here in the Berkshires, uh, then share the results for broad replication. Uh, the title of this year's lecture is Towards a New Reconstruction, Land, Racism, and Economic Emancipation. Uh, I want to thank our partner, Multicultural Bridge. There's some information out front. You can learn more about them. Uh, and thank our sponsors, the Christopher, Christopher Reynolds Foundation and the Good Work Institute. Uh, and then also to thank Cynthia Parsons, who donated the lovely flower arrangements. And of course, the Schumacher team for putting on this amazing event. Um, as we mentioned when you came in, you'll find index cards in your program. Uh, if you want to write down a question for one of the speakers, there'll be a Q&A after they both speak. Um, and now I have the great privilege to introduce Jody Evans, who's going to kick things off. Uh, Jody is the co-founder and co-director of Code Pink, and has been a peace, environmental, women's rights, and social justice activist for 40 years. She's traveled extensively to war zones, promoting and learning about peaceful resolution to conflict. She served in the administration of Governor Jerry Brown and ran his presidential campaign in 1992. She's published two books, Stop the Next War Now and Twilight of Empire, and has produced several documentary films, including the Oscar-nominated The Most Dangerous Man in America and Howard Zinn's The People Speak. Evans is the board chair of Women's Media Center and sits on many other boards, including Rainforest Action Network, Drug Policy Alliance, Institute of Policy Studies, Women Moving Millions, and Sisterhood is, uh, is Global Institute. And she's the mother of three, but she just told me she raised 11 children, and I thought having three kids was hard. So uh, put your hands together for Jody Evans. Thank you and welcome. And he forgot to say I'm on the board of the Schumacher Center, which is why I'm here today and really excited to introduce you to one of my heroes. So here we are near the birthplace of W.E.B. Du Bois. I was recently in Ghana visiting where he and his wife are laid to rest at their home that still has his vast library and receives daily visitors, reminding me of his internationalism, humanism, and his leadership in the Pan-Africanist movement. This year is the sesquicentennial anniversary of his birth and the Schumacher Board wanted this year's lectures to speak to his work. In 1935, Du Bois published the seminal work, Black Reconstruction in America. We open this 38th annual E.F. Schumacher Lectures with Ed Whitfield, who I call Du Boisian. Ed is a social critic, writer, and community activist who works with the beloved Community Center in Greensboro, North Carolina. After graduating as a presidential scholar from Little Rock Central High School in the late 60s, he went on to Cornell University where he became a leader of the black student movement during the period of struggle for establishment of black studies. Du Bois spent his early years writing about education and racism, about the need to democratize educational institutions and curricula. Whitfield followed in these footsteps at Cornell. Ed was and is a peace activist, and Du Bois was a leading spokesperson against U.S. nuclear armament. Ed left Cornell in 1970 to teach at the Malcolm X Liberation University in Greensboro. He later became the executive director of the Fund for Democratic Communities. Du Bois worked to understand the nature of black life in urban America and the social dilemmas of black worlds, a process culminating in the Philadelphia Negro, a foundation text in US sociology. Ed played a prominent role in the establishment of the Greensboro Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Du Bois, along with his comrade Paul Robeson, penned the brilliant We Charge Genocide, presented to the UN in 1951, which accused the US of systematically sanctioning murder and thus committing Jewish genocide against blacks in the US. 
Ed now speaks and writes on issues of cooperatives and economic development, while continuing to be interested in issues of war and peace, as well as education and social responses to racism and capitalism. Ed serves on the boards of the New Economy Coalition, the Working World, and the Southern Reparations Loan Fund. Du Bois was a lifelong revolutionary intellectual, brilliant author and orator, and I want to share his powerful words that speak to what Ed does and what Schumacher, Schumacher stood for. Perhaps the most extraordinary characteristic of current America is the attempt to reduce life to buying and selling. Life is not love unless love is sex and bought and sold. Life is not knowledge, save knowledge of technique, of science for destruction. Life is not beauty, except beauty for sale. Life is not art, unless its price is high and is sold for profit. All life is production for profit, and for what is profit, but for buying and selling again. But much of the power of Ed is in his humor, his music, and his capacity to connect to anyone, regardless of educational privilege or status. Ed is ridiculously good at explaining complex ideas in super engaging and clear ways, alivening all of our senses without intimidation or arrogance. I'm always interested to hear his unique perspectives that are informed by his profound knowledge of history and layered with personal experiences like being a mechanic in a factory. He has a capacity for storytelling and delivering powerful truths on the history of capitalism and imperialism and the relationship to slavery and deep racism while adding his touch of humor and always a dash of honey. Ed has a deep spiritual core with a wicked grasp of history. He can break it down for those of us doing the work and offer breadcrumbs on the path to a new economy of justice, peace, and equity. And then there's his music. He is a very talented musician, and it is often how he connects with his flute or guitar. But I love even more that he makes and invents instruments. He machines new things. We are all required to reimagine a future and begin building it today. Ed is devoting his life to traveling the country and the world in support of people, young and old, in the movements for a new economy. Pay attention. He is a tuning fork for the future we dream of. I'm deeply grateful to bring Ed to our stage. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. Uh, several of those things I haven't quite done yet, but maybe I will before I get older. Uh, I'm aging very, very quickly. Uh, I understand that time is moving faster now than it ever has before. And if anyone here can understand what that means, I would like for them to explain it to me. <laughs> I am highly honored to be here. Um, some of my heroes have uh, have made these talks and had them preserved where I've been able to read them and uh, have been moved by deeply people like Leopold Kor, Ivan Illich, Wendell Berry, and now I get a chance to stand on that same stage for some work that the Schumacher Center has been doing evidently for nearly four decades of, uh, of offering a platform and, and, and a means of repository for some challenging ideas for these challenging times that we live in. Uh, we live in an increasingly complex world that is so complex that no one can possibly actually understand all of it. Uh, but there's a need to understand the parts of it that we can grasp in a way that move us to deeply look at them and not settle for kind of superficial, sloganeering, social media, Twitter type lines on what's going on and what it really means. We need to get beneath the surface and understand things deeply. Uh, so I'm going to use this as an opportunity to do something that most people I know won't do. If I chuckle periodically, it's because uh, I'm thinking that, am I really going to do this? It's like, yeah. <laughs> I want to talk about just a very, very little about this question of uh, 
a just transition framework that a lot of people use, where the question of what is the current form of governance that I think uh, I have some challenges with the idea that the current form of governance in the new world is militarism. It's pretty clear to me it is the rule of capital. And I think that if we think it is militarism and don't recognize that it is a rule of capital and then excuse that change in the form formulation with the fact that, well, you know, capital uses militarism. It absolutely does. Uh, but capital dominates in a way that is pervasive, not only the military, but also entertainment, athletics, uh, news, uh, education, uh, every system, uh, professional sports, every system is dominated by capital. And sometimes we don't quite grasp that, particularly given that we live in a world where recent, in recent years, somebody has decided that everything useful and good is capital. So it's like, oh, don't worry about the fact you don't have any money, because you could have social capital, or political capital, or spiritual capital, or basket weaving capital, some kind of capital you have. And I'm reminded, it's almost like being on the Oprah show. It's like, look under your seat. You've got capital. You've got capital. You've got capital. Everybody's got capital. So how could you be against capital? It's a wonderful thing. To, all these useful. And don't worry about the fact that money is being concentrated in some hands of people with the singular logic of using that money to expand into more and more money, and as such, it dominates the world and increases the power into a shrinking handful of people while making everybody else live precariously. Don't worry about that capital, because it's no better than the capital you already have. I think, I think that there's something being done there to obscure the understanding of the nature of our times in such a way that makes it more difficult rather than less difficult, makes it more difficult for us to build the kinds of struggles we have and identify what is the actual nature of the system and situation we live in. I also want to use it to take up a time to, I have friends who uh, have suggested to me that perhaps we shouldn't talk as much about democracy because, because democracy is a Greek word. And I was like, I'm thinking, okay, I'm having this discussion with you in English, and you've identified that this is a Greek word that means something that was in practice in a bicameral election system in West Africa. And I'm not sure, <laughs> I'm not sure how we're looking at so how do we identify a big concept with the continent? Is it the question of where it came from, how it was developed, where it was named, or where it is used. I mean, which of those things would determine that is European or African or Greek? Or Greek's not a continent. But European or Africa, well, you're probably not even really continent either. It's most likely actually part of Asia. But the idea that you can identify these things as have some continental source without saying what it is about them. And I think it's an incredibly important concept of being able to do things that are of, by, and for the people, regardless how we want to name it. And many of us name that democratic. And I also want to challenge us to think about democracy in a way that embraces what I talk about as SASH, S-A-S-H. I'm talking about the spirit, the art, the science, and the habits of democracy. That if you're not governed by the spirit of democracy, and you just come to me like, we're going to use consensus, I will think for a minute, and it's like, OK, I know how to game that to get my, get my way. I'll phrase things in such a way that you can never construct a uniform thing, and then I can block, and I will be able to, you know, I could do that. Or we're going to use Robert's Rules of Order. Or you shouldn't use Robert's Rules of Order, you should use Roberta's Rules of Order. All of these things belie the fact that unless you're guided by a spirit of democracy, of really thinking that it is important to understand what is of, by, and for the people. And unless you're guided by a creative sense of being able to identify and come up with new and beautiful ways to do it, which is, I would say, the art of democracy, then you will be in trouble. And if you're not able to, at some point, codify these things in such a way that you can translate the ideas that you're using about some good ways to do some things and some bad ways to do some things, which is to say, to identify the science of democracy, and if you're not able to do it over and over and over again until it becomes ingrained into how you think and how you do things, which is said that you develop the habits of democracy, then you have some challenges and weaknesses. And to me, the main part of democracy, as I'll talk about a little later, is our ability to think together with others to understand how the world really is and how we should really behave in the world. So that's the democratic essence, even if we have to name it by a Greek word. 
All right. Um, and I want to take on a, an argument and a disagreement with some, another group of people I know who a lot of people praise very, very highly for a level of work that doesn't actually exist. Uh, so there's some folk who have been portraying the fact that they're putting together a series of nine interlocked worker cooperatives that, that are connected with uh, the transformation of local government in what is to be the most radical city in the country and that this is a profound and deep way to move forward. And sadly, it's, it's not there. And if you go there and look for it, you will see that it's not there, except I've seen some people who went, and they couldn't tell that it wasn't there, and I want to scream at them, the emperor has no clothes. I mean, you have to look. If you look at a quarter acre in the backyard, you can't call it Freedom Farms. You've insulted Fannie Lou Hamer, who actually built Freedom Farms and fed hundreds of families and built spinoff organizations and stuff. And we have a capacity and a tendency to identify things that are fashionable and promote them even above and beyond what they actually are to the detriment of building movements. And I say this not to be mean or to try to expose something, but because I want to win. And we can't win by spreading deceit about what's going on. We have to express the, the hard, real truth. So if I tell you about the Renaissance Community Grocery Store in Greensboro, I'm going to start off with, they told us we couldn't do it. We've done it. We've got a store there that's open that's actually feeding 17 families. So they, they, the money they earn there is, is sending their kids to school and paying their rent. But we're having a hard time getting the revenues up to what they need to do. We're struggling. A bill in a grocery store in a working class neighborhood in a food desert is hard work and we're having a hard time at it. And I don't want you to think anything other than that because you'll be asking me how, for information about how I can tell you how you can do it. And I'm trying to figure out how to do it, but I'll tell you that it's hard, which is one of the most important things you need to understand about it before you do it. I think we have to be kind of radically and ruthlessly honest about our strengths and our weaknesses. In the absence of being able to do that, we mislead people and don't promote moving the movement forward. So, having gotten out of the way that I disagree with a bunch of people, uh, I want to say a little bit about me. I am originally from Little Rock, Arkansas. Grew up there in the 50s and 60s. I was born in 1949. So by the time I graduated from high school, 1967, which was 10 years after the uh, incredible crisis in, in public education in the United States, where the President of the United States had to send the 101st Airborne out of Fort Campbell, Kentucky into Little Rock, Arkansas, so that nine black children could enter a school without, without being injured and killed. Quite frankly, that's what was at stake there. Um, I grew up within the black freedom movement. I grew, up in a, I grew up in a house full of guns, and I have never pointed a gun at anybody in my life, and I hope never to. Uh, but my father wanted us to know how to, to use them. And I was 50. And I think he had passed away before I had found out what that was about. He used to talk about him vaguely as something around protecting the home. And we didn't hunt, but he took us all out target practicing. And he talked about, you know, this was to kind of protect us. And I never knew, it was like if somebody steals, but we didn't have anything worth stealing. And nor were the kind of folk who would shoot somebody for stealing something. That just wasn't it. I found out after I was grown, I was in my 50s, I think, that when my dad was 18 years old, there was a lynching in Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, a guy named John Carter. It was the last major lynching. It took place in 1927 there. And uh, he got shot 100 times, hung on a lamppole, cut down. Coroner came, said, anybody know what happened? Everybody goes, well, we don't know what happened. And he was down death at unknown hands while standing in the crowd of murderers who had killed him. So <laughs> while he didn't know that, he evidently somebody later said, Anybody want to drag this nigga through town? And all the hands went up. So they tied the body to the back of a pickup truck, drove it to the center of the black business district in Little Rock, Arkansas, broke into the largest black church in town, which was Bethel Amy Church, which was a church that my mother would have been attending. Uh, but they, it wasn't a church. It wasn't a Sunday, so she wasn't there. But broke into Bethel Amy Church, took out the pulpit furniture, and built a pyre on which they burned the body. The mayor and the chief of police left town around 6 o'clock in the evening. Somebody was seen out in the street directing traffic around the, the scene of this with the charred arm off of the body. And then when the mob started fanning out into the rest of the community, that's when some people came out on their porches and said, we don't know what y'all are doing, but y'all not going to bring that mess up in here with our families and with shotguns. And so then I understood why I had grown up in a house full of guns. 
a story that isn't often told, but so I wanted to tell you this is an opportunity for me to share some things that I don't get a chance to talk about very often. Um, but again, fortunately, the next major incident was 1957, and while there were, again, lynch mobs in the street in Little Rock, Arkansas, the military came. The federal government had changed sides. A lot of people don't understand this about the Civil Rights Movement, and I want to say it here very clearly, that what happened in the 60s and 70s wasn't so much that black people became more courageous and stood up, finally, and moved to the front of the bus, 50s, 60s, 70s, finally. They had been standing up and been courageous all along, but they were often shot down and slaughtered. In Elaine, Arkansas, in the red summer of 1919, uh, uh, in, in Louisiana, in Memphis, uh, all the period following, following the end of Reconstruction, and even during Reconstruction in the 1860s, in the 1871, in the election riot in this small town in Alabama, uh, in Wilmington, North Carolina. Folks have been standing up, and they've been slaughtered often with the federal government taking side of the murdering hordes coming into the community, displacing people, stealing their property, and chasing them out of town. The federal government was on that side. Then, during the Cold War, when the question of how are we going to deal with these emerging nations of Asia, Africa, and Latin America, who, when given the choice between the United States and the Soviet Union, say, yeah, but over there in the United States, look at how they treat the black folk. And John Foster Dulles explained to Eisenhower, like, we're going to need to do something. We're going to do this differently. And so the federal government switched sides. So with the intervention of, of the Army in Little Rock to, to allow some children to go to school, there was a motion toward switching sides, sometimes effectively, sometimes ineffectively, unfortunately having really strange agents like, F, like uh, uh, Hoover <laughs> as the agent of the government supposedly protecting our rights. But if you ever see the movie Mississippi Burning, don't believe it. That's not how that went down. Um, but yes, yeah, so there was a shift, and it was a shift that enabled some people to move forward some leaps, and every time you take a step forward, you're able to open up new doors and new avenues and new opportunities. And so the work of SNCC, that I consider really heroic work, where they went in those places where people had been afraid to go and afraid to build organizations, and where there were only a few people already there on the ground, uh, people like Mega Evers. I was just in his home. Uh, about two weeks ago and saw the blood stains on the driveway that is still there from where, from where he was shot, coming back home to his family. Uh, but very few people could withstand that, but the, a lot of people were courageous. And again, with the shifting of the federal government, somewhat, some of us survived that in a time we might have otherwise been slaughtered. But survived we did, and it's all part of a black radical tradition that continues and it's alive today. It's alive today with young people like the speaker that's coming up after me, um, like the people I know I'm working with in the Black Land and Liberation Initiative, like the people building independent uh, communities and liberated zones, places like Wild Seed that's not far down the road from here. There, there's a, there, is a, there is a black liberation movement that is alive and vibrant and well today, and a black radical tradition that it is part of. So I'm going to talk, though, about economics in the context of the freedom movement. Because I think that there's a lot to be learned about economics from thinking about and trying to understand freedom, and there's a lot to be learned about freedom by understanding something about economics. And hopefully I'll get a chance to introduce to you some people that you might not have heard of before, but I think their thinking and their writing will help to, uh, to, help to illuminate some ways of understanding the current contradictions in the economy. But, um, Y'all know Harriet Tubman once said, I freed a thousand people and I freed a thousand more if, uh, if they knew they were slaves. Anybody know Harriet Tubman said that? Yeah. Would anybody here be disappointed to know Harriet Tubman never said that? <laughs> yeah, she didn't. Uh, there's no evidence for that quote that, that it's any earlier than about 1990. So somebody made that up, attributed to her, spread it around. This is what I'm saying. I'm going to expose things that I found out. It's like, not quite like that. I do have some things that she actually did say that I think, <laughs> um, that I think are worth, worth hearing. Uh, this is fun, so just give me a second here. I assure you it's not linear. I wrote some stuff down, and it's like, I'm not going to go through that. Not in the order I wrote it. My gosh. Um, what she did say was, I was a conductor of the Underground Railroad for eight years, and I can say what most conductors can't say. 
I never ran my train off the track, and I never lost a passenger. What she did say was, I had reasoned this out in my mind. There was one of two things I had a right to, liberty or death. If I could not have one, I would have the other. For no man should take me alive. I should fight for my liberty as long as my strength lasted. And when the time came for me to go, the Lord would let me take them. What she did say was, there was no one to welcome me to the land of freedom. I was a stranger in a strange land, and my home, after all, was down in Maryland because my father, my mother, my brothers and sisters and friends were there. But I was free, and they should be free. What she did say was, slavery is the next thing to hell. Now, why would somebody who knew that slavery was the next thing to hell think that she hadn't saved more people from it because they didn't know they were slaves? And it, it, sadly, it fits into this narrative about, you know, slavery's really kind of benign for some people. It's kind of fun, and they didn't really care. They got a chance to drink every Christmas. And no, Harry Tubman didn't say that. So I think it's useful for us to know that. And she went on to say, I grew up like a neglected weed, ignorant of liberty, having no experience of it. Then I was not happy or contented. And I prayed to God to make me strong and able to fight. And that's what I've always prayed for ever since then. God's time, emancipation, is always near. He says to the North Star in the heavens, he gave me the strength in my limbs. He meant I should be free. That's what she did say. And it's so much better than I freed a thousand people because it actually wasn't a thousand. And she didn't believe that there were people who didn't want to be free, nor should we, even the people don't understand exactly how they were going to get to be free. But we, ought to, we have to deepen and understand what it even means. And for that... I want people to know about uh, something that happened in 1865. Uh, it was on Thursday, the 12th of January, 1865. 20, what were called at the time, Negro ministers met in Savannah, Georgia with William Tecumseh Sherman. And Sherman wanted to know, <laughs> you know, you know the question like, what you people want, okay? So he had this meeting with these ministers. And there's 20 of them, including uh, one, one minister, Frazier. Garrison Frazier was 67 years old, born in Granville County, North Carolina, had been enslaved until eight years before the war ended when he paid $1,000 in gold and silver to buy himself and his wife's freedom. And, you know, it's like, I think that's so cool. 1865, you pay a thousand, 1864, I guess, eight months before. You pay $1,000 for your freedom. That was a lot of money back then. And so somebody who was enslaved, who was only able to do odd jobs and scrape together a little here and there, found it important enough to pay $1,000 for his freedom. And I see people wanting to work in communities and wanting to go there with their charitable ideas, and they say, well, you know, those people over there, they don't have nothing, so, you know, we're just going to have to give them something. And, uh, and in doing so, Damage the dignity of the relationships that can be made when you recognize that everybody needs and deserves to be free, and that quite frankly, if given an opportunity, people are willing to contribute to that. And to the extent we ignore that, we devalue the very people we're talking about. But anyhow, there were these 20 Negro ministers in Savannah, Georgia, met with Sherman, and Sherman asked them this question. Uh, State what you understand by slavery and the freedom that is given by the president's proclamation. And Frazier, who was representing the group, responded, slavery is receiving by irresistible power the work of another person and not by their consent. The freedom, as I understand it, promised by the proclamation is taking us from under the yoke of bondage and placing us where we could reap the fruit of our own labor take care of ourselves and assist the government in maintaining our freedom. Okay. When I think about it, I think I can't come up with a much more profound understanding of what it meant to him to be enslaved. It's like when you had to work your ass off and somebody else gets the benefit of your labor without your permission by force. And that what he wanted to do to be free, he wasn't talking about, I want to float around like a bee, I want to blow in the wind like a leaf. Uh, he said, I want to be able to work and retain the product of my own labor. 
In fact, later in the meeting, they suggested that we would like access to land in order to do this. And if we had land, we would work it by our own hands until we could pay for it. And then I mean, he wasn't even trying to get people to give him land. He wanted some land to work on so that he could pay for it and then move those communities to be self-reliant and independent. And so it's so important that there are people working on these issues and matters of land because, again, it's a reflection of an understanding that happened by a simple man who had become a minister but found a way to scrape together $1,000 because he wanted to be free so bad and he knew that what he needed was the opportunity to retain the product of his own labor. And doesn't that let you know that so many people in the modern world today are still really not free? So I'm going to talk about this connection between the product of your labor and freedom. And I want to posit something. I want to claim that most of us, except in extraordinary circumstances, and you can figure out what they are if somebody's really, really sick or injured or near death or an infant or something, but most of us are capable of being productive and producing more than we need for ourselves alone. And it is this excess, this surplus, that when accumulated by a capitalist and used for the purpose of its own expansion becomes capital, when this excess is accumulated by a landlord, it goes in the form of rent. When this excess is accumulated by taxes, by some governmental structure, it goes in the form of tax revenues. But, but it's all rooted in the fact that people, productive people are capable of being produced, productive and producing more than what they need for themselves. Other than that, you couldn't have an exploitative system. If you took from people and didn't leave them enough for what they do themselves, then they die out. And best I can tell, that's actually the, lab the uh, system of slavery that was practiced by the French in, the, uh, in, in Haiti and some other places. They literally worked people to death, uh, found out it was cheaper to buy some more than to uh, let people have what they needed in order to stay alive. That's pretty crude. So I'm reading on the internet the other night, I was watching a, a video, and somebody was talking about in 1851, this uh, French inventor had made one, the, the basis of what is the current modern lathe. It's a, it's a machine tool used for turning round pieces, typically boring holes. And this thing he built in 1851 is what allowed for there to be an industrial revolution and modern highly precision tools. And this allowed the incredible expansion of wealth and, and stuff in the world that took place since then. And I'm thinking, wow, all that came from this guy who was so smart that he made a lathe. And I started thinking about, wait a minute. What would have been the conditions required for him to make a lathe? While he was inventing this lathe, he was not growing potatoes or chasing down chickens. So he must have had somebody who was growing food, growing enough food for him to eat so he could have the leisure to be an inventor. And more than that, the lathe was used to make, turn copper cylinders that were used for making moray silk. And so for him to put the research and time into building this machine, there had to be a sufficient market for moray silk for some people to buy this luxury goods made by this special machinery. And so I'm thinking, well, what would have the growing market have been? Where would people have had the kind of money? And then because like, oh, yeah. Yeah, they had the sugar thing going on in Haiti. And, and there was a huge amounts of profits that were being repatriated while they were working people to death. And this is what was sitting there in Europe and piling up a pile of money that allowed for a leisure group of people to sitting around inventing machines and other people buying luxury goods and stuff. And he left that out. So somehow we have a picture of, of modernity and progress that has to do with brilliant people coming up with great ideas and leave out the fact that the fundamental basis for any and all of that happening is the labor of people. And so even, let's go back, the pyramids in Egypt. Do y'all know there wouldn't be any pyramids in Egypt if working people in the agricultural sector in Egypt didn't grow enough food to feed themselves and their families and feed all the people building the pyramids? There wouldn't be any. So this is one of the kind of uses of social surplus. Now, I want to make it clear that the social surplus that went into building the pyramids was never capital. Because for it to become capital, there would have been a liquidity event. And as best I know, no one ever sold a pyramid after they built it. But on the other hand, the depreciation schedule, the straight line depreciation of it had to be really, really interesting to look at because they're still sitting there you know, after thousands of years. But anyway, we can look at these things in the modern world and see that the excess production, surplus value has been produced and often goes into community wealth and that sometimes it can go into capital. 
But for many years, the community wealth was somewhat different from. So I want to make this clear. The community wealth and capital aren't the same things. So if you identify a bunch of money in a community, I don't know whether it's capital or not unless I know whether or not it's being used to expand itself. Other than that, it could be the wealth generated and all of it comes from human labor surplus. Surplus, accumulate, this has to take place because they are cyclical, they are acute, and they are chronic reasons why somebody would want to make sure that they, they store up and produce a little, little extra. Cyclically, the winter comes. And during the winter, you can't grow as many things as you grew during the summer. So it's really good when stuff is growing to grow extra so you can store it up and make it for the winter. Acute, the locust can come. And they can wipe out an entire field crop. And they're just flowering off looking big, fat, grubby insects that they are. That's an acute event. There can be chronic things that take place over periods of years. There can be weather change. Oh, no, the weather can't. The climate couldn't change, could it? Maybe it could. Anyhow, even a long time ago, there could be changes in the weather where a particular area would have a drought that might last for several years, for which if they had been able to store up enough when the, the harvests were good, they would be able to go through that and then when things were optimum again. So people have a need to store up this extra surplus which under capitalism becomes capital and dominates everything else. But in previous times, it was the buffer that helped people stay alive and be all right, right? All of that was community wealth. So a wealthy community is a community that's capable of producing enough surplus to do some of the things it needs to do. And it can go into monuments. It can go into jewelry. It can go into grain stores for, for, for bad weather. It can go into a lot of things that's all community wealth. So we need not think that our task in the world is to continue the expansion of capital, even though it might be to continue the expansion of community wealth. You see the distinction I'm making here? Because again, if we narrow down what community wealth is good for, that well, if, you know, we got a savings club, we put some money together, well, we need to put that so we can, can draw some interest for us now, maybe, or you might need to put it in band uniforms. And don't tell me that's banned capital. <laughs> You've got banned capital. No. Um, we not, might need it to put in education and healthcare systems. So when I think about an economy, I'm thinking about we engage in meeting people's needs and elevating the quality of life. So the meeting of needs takes place at the level of consumption, that people have to eat and stuff to stay alive. But the elevation of the quality of life has to do with how we utilize our surplus to the benefit of, uh, I knew that would happen, utilize our surplus to the benefit of the communities we're part of. Um, and for that, I say that we need to identify how the community's wealth has been held and how it has been stored and ways to redirect that back into communities in such a way to meet the needs and elevate the quality of life. Um, there's some work I'm engaged in doing. Uh, we're building the Southern Reparations Loan Fund as part of a financial commons that is uh, being renamed, the subject will be along the lines of, of seed. And we all know the generative properties of seeds, and that's how we look to use this, 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 these resources that we're generating and gathering. Uh, right now, from low-hanging fruit, from easy sources, from people who want to make a social impact and make a difference, people who have inherited wealth and that, that they recognize is not theirs to hoard over in its use, but that they want to make it back available to communities. And we're glad that such people exist. Later on, there might be a time when there are other ways to gain access to the community's wealth that is right now being squandered. But I don't know how to confiscate a whole bunch of folks' stuff. As soon as I figure it out, we're going to be doing it. <laughs> Just saying. Um, you know, there's a thing that uh, I had been talking about the the black radical tradition. And there's a piece of it that, that again, I wouldn't want to share, I would want to share, which is this thing that, uh, that Rap Brown wrote in 1968 when he was in prison. He said that, uh, that every day one has to compromise with a corrupt system and isn't able to do anything about it, that it takes away part of our humanity and that no slave should die a natural death. He said that if somebody 
dies in their celebration in the, in the slave yard, you have to wonder why. Because that meant that somebody remained without having built the fight and rebelled. But I've come to understand two things. That on the one hand, many of us who are African American in the United States, we're the descendants of the people who did not jump overboard and take their children, refusing to let them be enslaved, but rather said that I will persist because I think that some point it's going to be a brighter day and, and we're going to hold on for that. And so I'm thinking, well, wow, we descended from that crowd. And then I'm also realizing that the, to have descended from something is not just to biologically descend from it. There's a, this thing of the spiritual and cultural values that exist. So that for everyone that did jump overboard and say, I, I'll be dead before I'll be a slave, as Harry Tubman had said, that we're also descendants of them and carry them with us inside every day. So, you know, I carry the genetic material of one group of folk. I carry the intellectual, emotional, cultural, spiritual um, evidence and, and, and residue of another group of people. And it's all important in terms of who we are and what we have to do and be. Um, so we're building a new world where I want us to stress the idea that we have to build freedom. We won't find it, we won't just fight for it, we have to actually construct it. So there's an idea I've been sharing with some friends and it seemed to resonate with them, which is about building liberated zones. Um, think about this, suppose there had been elections on plantations and you were told, you know, we're gonna be able to vote on uh, who the next overseer gonna be. Like, oh, hey, we can, can we pick anybody? No, 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 no. You had to pick from among the ones that they say you can pick from. And they, so they're going to come out here and they're going to tell us what they're going to do. So one guy gets up and says, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to limit the number of lashes. We're not going to lash y'all no more than 50, 75 times. Because, you know, when you whip somebody 100 times, it, it can damn near kill them. So I'm going to put a limit on number of lashes. And one, some of us say, hmm, that's, that's interesting. And they always say, I'm going to do a thing where I'm going to promote that we can keep families together you know, all the way up until Massa have to sell you off to make some little extra cash, but up until the end, the families can stay together and live together in the quarters. And I went say, hmm, that's kind of interesting. And on the back road, there's a dude kind of looking up in the air. And somebody said, Willie, what you looking for? He said, I'm looking for the North Star, because first chance I get, I'm out of here. I'm not all that interested in figuring out whether you could either li limit the number of lashes or, or make, keep my family together until somebody needs to do otherwise. And it's like, but those things make a difference. Yeah, they make a difference, but not enough difference. So if we're talking about freedom, we have to figure out how to keep the North Star in mind. We have to figure out how to keep our eye on a goal. And might that goal not be to construct an order of society in which every person has a chance to benefit from the product of their own labor? And again, I, I'm, I'm approaching this from the standpoint of being productive, not from the standpoint of enhancing consumption. There's a big issue that a lot of people are talking about. Now, my guess is some people in this room would think this, so don't be mad at me, but I can make this point very clearly later. The guaranteed annual income would be a really, really great step forward. I'm going, this is a terrible idea. I said, what do you mean it's a terrible idea? I said, you cannot solve at the level of consumption a problem that is created in the realm of production. So you have stripped away the capacity of people to be engaged in production, offering them instead that we'll give you, we'll give you a little something. And, and instead, and everything other than that is the same. In fact, quite frankly, that kind of lubricates this contradiction that is built into the capitalist system about constantly expanding production and not having sufficient people, because you pay people wages too low to even buy the product of labor, and worse yet, other capitalists have to buy it, but they will only buy it if they think they can expand. And so now they can expand because the government will print money and pass it out, and people will have some. This is a terrible idea. And it reminds me, I, I told people, uh, a guy named Bugani Finca uh, was uh, with the South African Truth Commission, came to the United States, and he talked about a dude named Thabo, who was in South Africa doing the reconciliation thing, and a guy named Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith was a white man, Thabo's an African, and Mr. Smith had stolen his cow. So, but Mr. Smith found out that if you go before the commission and you straighten out what you did, then, uh, then you would get amnesty and you don't have to worry about it anymore. So he goes and he said, Tabo, I stole your cow. I realized how wrong it was. I'm very, very sorry. You know, I, you know, I, I, I know I shouldn't have done it. 
And so I just want you to forgive me. So Tabo was visibly moved. He never thought he'd ever hear Mrs. Smith apologize for it. So they stood there, shook hands, they hugged each other, they probably even prayed together. And so Smith starts out the room and Tabo goes, wait. Smith turns around, wait for what? So what about the cow? Smith goes, it has nothing to do with the cow. You're ruining our reconciliation. It's like it has everything to do with the cow. But what if Smith had said, ah, you know, I tell you what, I'll give you a supply of butter. Tabo needed to explain, like, no, you give me back my damn cow, I can give you butter <laughs> and feed myself and my family. So we need to be able to be productive. And guaranteed ways doesn't shift that, doesn't change it. And we are looking instead for creating opportunities for everyone to be fully productive and express their dignity through that. And I kind of want to end, because okay, I've been standing here too long, I want to end by sharing something, or two more things. There's a theory going around that, that, uh, that labor and being productive is going out of style because we got robots that can make robots and like, you know, so let's just tax the robots and then pass it out as a guarantee. You know, I'm going a couple of things. One, the motion toward having everything made by robots probably not as far along as some people in the street think it is because my guess is that most of the clothes you're wearing was made on a sewing machine that's pretty much like the one that was invented at the last part of the 19th century and uh, by some women, most likely women, sitting in some part of the world that you don't have to see, but it wasn't a robot. Most of the clothes you're wearing are that, most of the shoes you're wearing are that, a lot of the food is growing that way. So this thing about robots have taken over everything is probably exaggerated. And the idea of robots making robots, which some people propose could go, isn't even a good idea. <laughs> I've seen Terminator 3. I don't want to see robots <laughs> making robots, okay? So we, we have a situation in which that's being exaggerated, and the assumption is, well, we have these throwaway people, and so we're going to have to just give them something. And I say, why don't those of us who want to build a new economy find the people who have been thrown away by the old economy and use them as the basis for building the new economy? Why don't we find productive spaces and make sure that the resources and things required for them to be productive? Because to be productive at that level is transformational. It is all together, and for you who have been told all your life that you're worth nothing, you can't do anything, and you point over there, you see that building over there? Yeah, I built that, so I can't be worthless, okay? So we're gonna have to find a way to build the new economy out of, out of the people thrown away in the old economy and build something that's really efficient. But I do wanna end by sharing something to Hildegard. My dear friend Hildegard Hannon is on the board with me in the New Economy Coalition, and I had been talking about, I was coming up here to do this, and I shared something with her in a meeting. And she said, Ed, you need to make sure that you put that as part of your, your Schumacher lecture. I had told her, I said, I invented a religion, which might sound to some people kind of weird. But you know, I, I know a lot of people I have all my life who tell me that they believe in every single word of some doctrine, a book or something. And sadly, I realized a lot of them haven't actually read every single word of it. So I wanted to come up with a religion that was short enough, it'll fit on one page, and you could actually read all of it. And so I periodically read it to people. My religion is called the Heretical Church of the Latter-day Infidel. The reason for that is that the real Greek, again, roots of the word heresy had to do with to choose, which was around choosing what you would believe and understand rather than accepting dogma. And obviously infidels are people who are not faithful to, and I'm, so I'm, I'm a heretic and an infidel. And um, so listen to it, though. It's very short, and I'll end with this. Remember that all memory and all truth is selective and incomplete, including whatever may be true here. Statement of beliefs, I struggle to avoid all dogma. I believe in the changing, inconsistent, contradictory harmony of a complex, emergent universe and little else. I believe in loving and being loved. I believe in making and appreciating beauty. I believe that seeking the truth by questioning everything is the holiest of activities. I oppose violence, including violence against me. I believe in finding good wherever it can be found. I believe in creating good whenever possible. I believe in strengthening the weak and exploit it so that they can do for themselves. I believe in taking away the unearned, undeserved strength and advantage of exploiters so they can rejoin the human mass as equals rather than as selfish superiors. And I believe in creating the world I would want to live in. Opportunities can be found all around us. When there is justice, we have the opportunity to grow and prosper. Where there is great injustice, we have the opportunity to fight for a better world. Our moment is this moment. 
there is always something important to do. In every moment, there is meaning, and in every moment, great beauty can be corrected, created. We need not look for meaning in things or situations. We create meaning rather than find it. True freedom is not so much about making a choice as it is about creating the choices that are made available. I know in democracy, the essence of democracy is less in finding opportunities to register our opinion than in creating opportunities to think together with others to form our ideas of how the world should be and how we should behave in the world. And finally, on sharing, leave for others as much as you take for yourself. Share with others what you are able to share. Be as responsive in consideration of others' desires as you would wish them to be in consideration of yours. Live so that all others could live like you and we would have a happy world. No more than this should be asked of anyone. No more than this is needed. That's all. Thank you very much.